Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Look at our history. We are Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea, pioneers who, who braved the unfamiliar, followed by a stampede of farmers and miners and entrepreneurs and hucksters. That's our spirit. That's who we are. We're Sojourner Truth and Fannie Lou Hamer, women who could do as much as any man and then some. And we're Susan B. Anthony who shook the system until the law reflected that truth. That is our character. So he goes into the preacher mode to a largely black crowd. And by the way, the New York Times in this march over the bridge in Selma uh, deleted or airbrushed out uh, the bushes at the uh, celebration. The Stalinist uh, newspaper of record, the New York Times, omitted them from the picture on the bridge. Instead, they showed that street vermin, Al Sharpton. If you can believe we've come to this point in American history, that a president would not only use such an event to stimulate anger, hatred, jealousy, vengeance, revenge, instead of bringing people together, instead of thanking America for how far we've come, saying that um, things are still no good, taking us into the darkness of the woods from the nation where the nation had already been and had uh, walked out of. We walked out of the darkness of the wood in which he drew us back into. And take a look at what Obama does with that nasty piece of work, Eric Holder. That nasty piece of work, Eric Holder, who has tried to crucify white policemen for not having gotten killed. That's what he's saying to them. Not enough of you have died. See, if more of you had died in interactions with thugs of any race, why then there'd be no charges against you. But that's what we have today, and we all know it. You would think that this man, after all these years, would have understood that he's dividing the nation, not uniting the nation. But he didn't, nor does he care, because he's doing just what he wants to do which is to divide black against white, white against black, gay against straight, straight against gay, Asian against Hispanic, Hispanic against black. That's what this man is spending every waking moment thinking about how to do. The speech was very familiar. I had heard speeches like this, and I've read of speeches like this in literature, the literature of the Soviet Union, the literature of Animal Farm written by George Orwell. It's classic Soviet propaganda enacted on the backs of African Americans. This is the truth. You have to understand what I'm saying to you. Uh, he's not the only one to engage in this, but we'll play many of these speeches and I'll, well, I'll explain to you why they agitate me. Now, I didn't listen to the speeches, just as the great president didn't listen to Netanyahu's address last Monday, so we're told, but he, he read the transcript. Well, I didn't listen to the speech, but I have the transcript and I have the speech for you to listen to. The show is called The White Owl. The show is about forgiveness and Obama's inability to offer forgiveness. Not for wrongs he's experienced, by the way. He was a spoiled white kid with a black father. Then he decided to become a downtrodden black man who he himself had experienced racism when he never did. See, he grew up in Honolulu, which is a multinational, multi ethnic place where there's almost no racial discrimination, except against whites, perhaps. And he had no experiences of racism, and yet he wraps himself in all the rhetoric of those who did. And I said to you, I saw the white owl. But if you'd like to hear something even more strange, make believe this is a late-night radio show right now, and it's not really a drive-time show across the biggest stations in the country. Just join me in this thought for one minute. I'm telling you these dreams are real. I'm telling you I had these dreams. I'm sharing these dreams with you for a reason. Because my soul spirit came to me in my dream last night. Those of you who are intuitive, those of you who are artists, those of you who deal in other dimensions, those of you who know that there's another dimension other than the two-dimensional world in which we live and the two-dimensional world in which we talk about all day long, which is the world of politics, which is really a one-dimensional world of cardboard men and women. There's another world, or many worlds. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? 
And I'm reaching across these worlds to you, my listener, to try to understand that the only thing that can save this nation, the only thing that can save this nation is spiritual. We have a void of spirituality in this nation that is not only hollowing us out, but destroying us entirely from top to bottom. And only by reaching within ourselves for our own spiritual center, whatever your religion may be or whatever your spiritual orientation may be, only by reaching into that realm or to that realm of yourself can you survive in this void created by Barack Obama, perhaps the most evil man to have ever invaded the White House. And I will use that word again. He is evil through and through because he knows better. He's a very, very bright man. In fact, he's a genius. He's a genius at dividing people. He's a genius at dismantling the greatest nation the world has ever seen. He's a genius at not tackling the worst barbarians to hit the planet since Genghis Khan and getting away with saying he's at war. He's a genius at dismantling our military. He's a genius at dismantling our economy by keeping interest rates at zero so the government can borrow without, let us say, increasing the debt beyond the comprehensible increase in debt. You see, if interest rates were even 2%, the debt would be skyrocketing to a point where it would be, wow, look what he's doing. But by having Grandma Yellen keep the interest rates at zero, he can borrow trillions to keep the government afloat. And then the interest rate is sort of maintained at only about $2 trillion or whatever it may be. God knows what the man is doing to us. You'll soon need a wheelbarrow filled with paper currency to buy a loaf of bread if this is not stopped. If you analyze what's wrong with this man and his presidency, the man doesn't have a scintilla of forgiveness in his soul. No, look who he surrounds himself with. One of the most hateful people in the history of America, Al Sharpton. A man who's built his entire, his entire, uh, let us say, edifice on, on hatred and division and lies, by the way. Look who he surrounds himself with. Are any of these people capable of forgiveness? Do any of these people espouse any of the values of Christianity which they claim to uh, uh, practice. I haven't seen the forgiveness of you. You would think that hundreds of years after slavery, hundreds of years after slavery, after the great society, after affirmative action, after trillions of dollars in welfare, after the first black president, the first black attorney general, and black folks running so much of this government, there would be forgiveness. But there is no forgiveness. There is only enmity. And so I say to you, the only hope for America is forgiveness. Maybe I have to have forgiveness in my heart for this demagogue who is destroying this nation that my grandfather first came to over a 100 years ago, destroying this nation for all immigrants forever. Because let me tell you something. When he gets through with it, the landscape will be pocked with, with craters. It will be pocked with craters that he created with the verbal bombs he has been throwing. A new low point was reached in the American presidency with his demagoguery. It gives a new meaning to the word demagogue. And we're talking about my attempts at forgiveness because unless we the people learn to forgive this man for his insanities and his divisiveness, he'll, bring, he'll drag us all down into his world and we can't allow him to take us there. He'll leave the nation with bomb craters in the hearts of all men is what he will do. He is the divider-in-chief, and it's because of one thing. It came to me in the dream. I figured out why Obama is so hateful. It's because he lacks forgiveness, and he seethes in resentment. He is not a practicing Christian. He may think he's a Christian. I don't care what he is, but he's not practicing Christianity, which is why there is a controversy about what his religion is and why he continuously expresses resentment. In the speech marking the 50th anniversary of the Selma March this weekend, a major event in the civil rights movement, which ended official segregation in America, and the beginning of bringing the races together in this country, what President Obama did on this occasion was he used it to divide America. His narcissism, his angry personality, helped him deliver a speech with the authority of someone deeply familiar with his subject, and yet he lacked the basic context, context and facts of a man who had more substance than style would have delivered. 
In the prepared speech written by his sorority, he said, we're the slaves who built the White House in the economy of the South. Now, you can dismiss this as setting the tone for how far African Americans have come in this nation because of the ideas expressed in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. But we know this president and his record of past statements, and we know what he really meant. He was telling the world that this country was built on the backs of slaves and that we owe black people a debt. Now, there are facts about having uh, built the White House. And you know what those facts are, don't you? The manual labor provided by the slaves was horrible. And they were not doing it voluntarily. And they were not being compensated for it. And we're not trying to say that they were. But Obama omits to say that there was an architect. There were engineers. There was management. There was capital investment for the raw materials that also went into building the White House. This is the same lie that leftists have been spewing since Karl Marx claimed that laborers provide all of the value of production. We respect laborers, bricklayers, carpenters, electricians, plumbers for doing good, honest work, without which there would be no construction, no building. But Obama and the leftists talk as if the building would exist without capitalists whose labor in the past produced the savings needed to invest in the raw materials, to pay the bricklayers and the carpenters, along with architects, engineers, and management, without whom the building also would not exist. You understand that? If the left wing is correct, and we don't need capitalism, then ask yourself why don't carpenters and bricklayers, or factory workers for that matter, just go to work and build a building without the capitalist, or work in the factory without the factory organizer or manager? Well, why don't they do what the capitalist has done himself instead of working for the capitalist? And so you see there's half-truths here. And the half-truths are very dangerous. They're more dangerous than a lie. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Be right back. Savage. We're the gay Americans whose blood ran in the streets of San Francisco and New York just as blood ran down this bridge. We are storytellers, writers, poets, artists who abhor unfairness and despise hypocrisy and give voice to the voiceless and tell truths that need to be told. We're the inventors of gospel and jazz and blues, bluegrass oh and country and hip-hop and rock and roll and our very own sound with all the sweet sorrow and reckless joy of freedom. Now, the man is so off the mark in his speech. It's hard to know who wrote this garbage for him. This is the mark of a progressive, deranged mind. He starts with, we're the gay Americans who, whose blood ran in the streets, and then he goes on to... Uh, gospel, jazz, blues, bluegrass, and country, and hip-hop, and rock and roll. Is he implying that everyone who wrote those songs and sang those songs were gay? Why does he put gay in with all of that? What's that got to do with it? Tell me. No one can understand what he's saying here. Earlier in this Selma speech, he said, we're the slaves who built the White House. And then he goes on to, we're the, t we're the fresh-faced GIs who fought to liberate a continent. And what is he saying there? They were all blacks? They were all African Americans? What is he trying to do here? Well, I told you what he's trying to do here, which is to divide us and create more enmity, not bring us together with less enmity. I told you he is creating a new low point in the American presidency, giving demagoguery a, a brand new meaning. And I also told you that he lacks forgiveness and seeds in resentment, and this indicates to me that he is not a practicing Christian. And I say that pointedly because there's been a lot of controversy about his religion. Even he himself has said, I am a Christian, I am not a Muslim. Well, it wouldn't matter to me what he was, as long as he had some charity in him and some forgiveness, but he has neither. He doesn't practice any religion, so far as I can tell, other than the religion of progressivism. And then I told you about a dream I had, which I called the white owl, with one hollow eye. I was walking on a trail in the woods to a familiar place with my son and someone else. And we came upon a woman, middle-aged woman, white woman, with, I thought, a dog on a long leash. And I said to her, do you often go to this place in the woods?